Happy Monday, everybody. What up, what up, what up? What up, what up? Did, did we just teleport through a week again? Suddenly we're back here? Yeah. Yep. All it cost was my hair. <laughs> What what if we did teleport and you didn't and 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 you were totally buying that I'm alternate universe Justin? Uh, and you're uh, just like, Justin B. Oh yeah, no, I just I just got my head shaved. I'm certainly not another person. Uh, uh, uh hold on, wait. I, am I believing you or not believing? you? I don't know. I mean, first of all, like I'm on your side because yeah. like 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 you're the transformed man. You're the one who went through some stuff, and the other one is the previous fraud still continuing to be a fraud but what if that was uh justin that was very uh friendly to you and and i was wronged by an alternate universe brian and now i'm working to undermine you from within i mean so nothing's changed yeah i was about to say i i, I just assume that's where we're yeah okay that tracks Alrighty. okay definitely was watching better call saul Strong Nacho Varga vibes. Mm. Well, I'm telling you, yeah. yeah. Michael Mondo, you're looking good. Very Mondo. When it when it starts to come back in, it's still gonna look good. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I that that's the that's the the nickname, Andrew Mondo. I would definitely be a Mondo. I would be an Armando, a highly an Armando selling mm. uh, a real estate that also, uh, uh, you know. Like his is as his friends have a business that's in some I do, way. Off I, the I do feel like you'd have to like go to the gym and learn how to flex your uh flare your nostrils. You know I bet you too in your trunk you've got your own motivational course you wrote. But yeah. the problem is is you're talking about business and you have to be very bleak about that other business. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I made over a million dollars. Uh in business. But doing what? Oh. In business. Real you know, estate like, related. Real estate. Real estate business. adjacent. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, you want to do some weird things? Let's Ready. Yep. All right, Andrew, I'll count you in for the Weird Things podcast in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. Justin Robert Young. Yo, what up? Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. So I saw this article via Ars Technica, and it's about a study that says... Hey, you know those signs they put over highways to tell you to like drive safely and you know be careful. And yeah, uh, uh, you mean the ones that they that they change up and like uh, I guess state money goes to some intern writing a clever Matthew McConaughey reference or something. Like, uh, hey, uh, wearing a seatbelt be a lot cooler if you did. Those right. Hey, uh, yeah. the Easter Bunny says, ribbit, ribbit, uh, drive safe. So they talked, they did a study when they used the, the Texas Department of Transportation, which was displaying a death toll, like they wanted to show the highway death toll from, you know, unsafe driving. And according to the study, when they did that, it went up. They had more accidents. People, people were like, well, that's not so bad. Yeah. I guess I can get loosey-goosey. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there are a lot of caveats with a study like this, let's be sure. But I do think that, hey, look over here. It might, you know, I've sometimes thought like, and like, I get when you got like dudes working in the highway, like when you got uh, people, uh, not just dudes, but people working in construction and stuff, which is extremely dangerous and why we need to slow down whenever we come across highway construction, because that is an extremely dangerous job, not made any easier by uh, idiots who go very fast. And I understand like having flashing signs and stuff like, please slow the hell down. You're going to murder somebody. I think that's very useful. Sure. But like, hey, let's just throw a little warning up there, you know, yeah. like in the middle of somebody's driving and like, ah, oh, what's going, let me read that sign and run into the car in front uh, of yeah, me. My, my, my favorite is the bitter irony when the message on the sign is like, hey, 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 whoa, 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 look over here, look over here. Don't drive distracted. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that one always gets me. I'm just like, why did you do that? Hey, get off your phone. Yeah. Look at the sign. Get off your phone. Read the sign. Yeah. They should text you. Stop I mean, looking at your phone. <laughs> You're driving right now. I mean, uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, I guess I, I and, want and to steel man both sides of this. Um, uh, the, uh, um, I do believe everybody's heart is in the right place. And I believe that people think these signs are very good. And indeed, 
in a pre waze era when not everyone had a smartphone and they didn't have the ability to send out alerts to everybody, these signs were probably extraordinarily visionary in their ability to, let's say, notice that an old person somewhere in the state of Texas has gone missing. Um, I, 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 uh, I am certain there's a non-zero number of Amber Alerts that have yielded discovered children or silver alerts that have found uh, wandering uh, dementia patients or whatever. Um, uh, blue alerts are a bit weird because it sounds like a gang war. Uh, but then, but then uh, in general, I think this is the seen versus unseen benefit. You see the thing that happens as a result of these alerts. The unseen thing that you don't see is, is like how many quiet fatalities there are because they have a giant sign saying, please pay attention to the sign, not the road. Well, I mean, but, but uh, I think that the issue here in this story is that uh, there was a, a processing by people who are, are, are looking at that sign and they're saying, oh, that number didn't seem so bad. Like, no, I'm definitely not going to be one of that number that's there. And, and so, so therefore, I mean, but then again, also this might just be noise. It might just be that, you know, uh, uh, the, that sign ran during a particularly more, uh, uh, you know, a time when there is high, uh, higher auto fatalities like 4th of July or during the holidays or something when there's inclement weather. Sure. But, but like, for example, the example sign here says 1,669 deaths this year on Texas roads. If you are thinking about whether that's a big number or a small number, you're you, not thinking you about definitely driving. You're not thinking about yeah, your, yeah, the the road. So it, it would so, be it would be just as bad if if the sign said there was a man from St. Ides. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, how do you think it ends? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, how does it end? So, to, to you know, the the researchers that did this were not idiots, and so one of the ways they did this was they measured the persistence of accidents near the sign and further away from the sign. So they looked at stretches of highway, how far away did things occur there, and when it was on or off, et cetera. And so there was a lot of things they did. To, I, I think they, from here, it looks like they did a pretty good job to say- To separating well all that we, out, yeah. Yeah, and again, and I'm sure they would be the first ones to tell you, like, more data needed, more data needed, and- and their because their prediction was we think this may cause distraction and they sound they did what seemed like a sound way to look into this and so we'll see but like you said everything you said there could be other factors so I, I would you know I don't I don't think any of us is running away from this going ah therefore it's proven it's consensus yeah. you know, and is- uh, now now here's the part where I flip everything on its side um, let's say as of now we have not had a category five hurricane swoop right into the middle of Austin. So as a result, all of our results would be skewed because I would only be looking at the scene detriment of, uh, of, of, you know, so-and-so is missing in his El Dorado or whatever. Um, and, and not seeing how many thousands of lives might be saved by a coordinated messaging system, uh, in a once in a thousand years storm hitting uh, all, all, all at once. Oh, I don't, yeah, I don't think there's an issue against messaging at all. I think the question is, is that when you do press that button, you have to be aware of like, okay, if I press this button, there might be a chance I'll cause a distraction. But if this button's to say, hey, there's a traffic jam ahead and you better slow down, seems like a good button to press. And, if it's like, uh, and and like you know, we, we were kind of joking earlier that it's probably some intern who does it, but nowadays a lot of copywriting is done by professional copywriters. I'm sure. If anything, the the state is probably paying a good amount of money to have someone be very oh, clever and very smart internal, and very cute. There's twelve layers to this. This is yeah. not a person who has you know uh, who's like in hold of an Instagram account. And so and so it ends up being a thing where yeah. they probably expect someone to write very good, clever thinkers, when really what you need is please drive safe. Or He's nothing at all. Or nothing at all. Maybe. Or nothing at all. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, and, and, I, I I do think that the the things that I've seen on those signs that have been the most constructive to me are just like traffic times to blank. Like, so, mm. so you're not even saying that it's necessarily like a traffic jam or something. You're just saying it is 15 minutes to an exit that you know is five minutes away. And you're just like, okay, that's I'll go around. good bite-sized information for which I can process. I know every inch of it immediately. And it's not like what, what, what you were saying in this study insinuates that, 
maybe giving too weighty or too complex a piece of information is counterintuitive. Well, and, and then meanwhile, I could also be convinced of, of the opposite side of, let's say, in the right circumstance, uh, in general, these signs should stay blank all the time. But uh, if they do stay blank all the time, then they don't get funded because people are like, why are those signs there? They're just We're blank not all using the time. them. Right. right. And and so and then then you have the moral calculus of like, well, how often do we put something on there so people feel like because because, again, ultimately, they're going to vote. It, 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 with their votes on yeah. whether or not we're going to continue to fund all. And if it always says the same thing, it always says the same thing. Don't right. we pay someone to write funny Austin stuff? And, th and then you keep get Austin safe. Who, who, <laughs> what, who is this voter? Uh, yeah, no, he's my favorite voter. <laughs> it's me. I am John Everyman. John Everyman. And I want Jeez. my son. So you, to be so you funny. really, you need them. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you, John Everyman, but uh, uh, so, so you need them to be funny. Well, well, well we're paying for them. You know, we're well, paying for the electricity. And think about oh, this, right? Let's say McDonald's was willing to sponsor a whole year's worth of these. If you just, you know, for one day put up a, hey, McRibs are great. Uh, then all of a sudden it's like you have the the other moral calculus of like, oh, is that what we're doing now? We're is we're having money? road signs paid for by McDonald's? It's like, well, better that than tax paper, dear. Ta uh, I mean, McRibs taxpayers. are awesome. So what's that a statement of fact mcribs are awesome they're, they so are a great a yeah they're a great invention uh yeah. maybe it should just be nice things like have a nice day oh yeah. you're a great person uh, well, remember so, that's, that's there see okay, there was a report this, this, confront, this, confront your inner demons this this, this makes me more upset okay sorry go there, ahead there's a report about a police department. I remember seeing this. And they had like a news mag, you know, TV news covering this where they were pulling people over to compliment them for good driving. Oh, and, God, Jesus. I've get the uh, hell. That, that is the fastest way for me to commit police brutality. Like that is, I will that, go to jail assaulting a police officer if I were pulled over and oh, then they I, just said, it, thank you. Yeah. It's what a compliment you on the driving. Here's a coupon for McDonald's. It's like literally that's what they're doing. Get like, out of here with that. Jeez. Uh, I mean, that really is, is like <laughs> it, it does. When, when, when you really accept the counterfactual possibilities, there's really no win on any of this. Oh, yeah. It's like imagine if the IRS showed up your door and told you, hey, good job on your taxes. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, I, I took my lunch break is for that... this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The IRS has an appointment with you. It's one o'clock. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, hey, good job, uh, citizen. Your friends at Harbor Freight just wanted to let you know you did a very good job paying your taxes this year. Yeah, uh, that, uh, but this does remind me a little bit of uh, this thing in Australia. I, I I only know the the broad strokes of it, but uh, in I don't know if it's ever I don't think it's everywhere, but in places in Australia, in lieu of a speed limit, you know the 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 electric electronic speed limit signs that say yeah. how fast you're going. Instead of giving you a number, it gives you a smiley face or a frowny face, and supposedly that has done a lot to reduce people's speeds and reduce traffic incidents. No kidding. And so when you're driving in the correct speed limit, you just get a green a green happy face. And when it's not, it just says slow down. So there is the idea of gamification of all this. Well, and, and the reason why I would assume is that uh, for the same reason that, uh, I don't know if there's anybody else among us that uh, was uh, 17, but when you see one of those signs, you want to find out exactly how fast you can make it go. Mm. And uh, uh, I, I think studies show those are the minority of people, uh, yes. not the majority. No, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, but they, I mean, I don't know, they happen, they, they exist. They do, they do. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, we were talking to the police officers uh, uh, over on a, a close by road that all of yeah. us have to go past. Uh, today, as a matter of fact, they just took down those signs. They they made them temporary because when you make them permanent, they, uh, you know, they reduce the, Lose the benefit. Their effectiveness. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep on moving them around, but in general, it's like, I mean, I don't, I don't like knowing that I'm accidentally speeding or whatever. Yeah. And I think by doing the smiley face, you get a little bit of an emotional element. Oh, I made the little happy face. Well, I think I drove just, correctly. Yeah, it, it's binary. So it's good driving, bad driving. It's not the number for which you even even in the context of you getting positive reinforcement for it, you're still doing math in your head 
based on what the number uh, uh, is above it versus the number that you're seeing below it. Whereas before, or with something like this, it's just like doing good, bad, slow down. Like it's it's it's. I think it's a simpler message. Yeah. Anyway, you know, it's not a simple message. No, it's a complicated message, but actually quite simple if you think about it the right way. Exactly, the Byzantine impenetrable world of Patreon.com/slash Weird Things. Oh. Bring your thesaurus and possibly a calculator to solve the grandest puzzle of them all. Patreon.com/slash Weird Things. Begin your years-long odyssey by pledging uh, money to us via this website. Once you've successfully become a patron, you will get bonus content, including the After Things podcast before anybody else, as well as the satisfaction of supporting independent creators. From that point, you just live your life, and hopefully you can conquer all the other challenges. It's the adventure of a lifetime that begins right now at patreon.com slash weird things. Is Nicolas Cage in this movie? I don't want to watch this movie. I'm, I'm a patron oh, for he's weird got things. A, he does some good ones too, Bryce. <laughs> he does. He just mixes it up sometimes. sometimes you know. Apparently the new movie's good. I, I've, I've heard good things about it. Mm. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, Bryce, do you like magic? Do you like magic tricks? Do, yeah. Yeah, magic's great. It's like you, it's really? like a like a uh, hey uh, Chuck E. Cheese employee. You like rats, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, magic great. Yes, I love rats <laughs> and pizza. <laughs> he does say the same thing over and over. Oh yeah, magic's great. Oh that. yeah, magic's great. Magic's I've rehearsed great. this line. You're not gonna trip me up. Magic's great. I love seeing some disappear or reappear. <laughs> what and leave show business? <laughs> <laughs> Uh yeah uh, no do we um uh yeah uh, do we do we buy do we buy Bryce on this guys Brian Justin thumbs up thumbs down <laughs> I do him? I think Bryce is telling the truth I think he I think he genuinely likes magic I think he loves it well, well I, I want to do an away. update to Blade Runner remember in Blade Runner they had the Voight comp test of course where they yeah. sat across yeah. the person they'd ask them mm. questions you see a tortoise in the desert do you flip them over you know and why aren't you flipping questions? him over. Yeah. yeah, exactly. These tests in an Android. And then they are going to add one where he's going to pull out a silk hanky and put it into his hand <laughs> and open it up and it's going to be gone. He's going to go, ta-da. <laughs> and then they're going to ask you, do you like this? Okay. Well, I, I, he, not, I like a good handkerchief routine. So. Because apparently, according to a study published in the Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity, and the Arts, people who hate magic tend to be higher in interpersonal dominance and psychopathy and lower in agreeableness. Basically, don't like magic. You're a psycho. You're a psychopath. Yes, I I saw this uh, floating around the internet the the other day, and I totally agree. I I think that that uh, uh, the people that hate magic tend to not be people I like personally. <laughs> well, uh, okay, um, how do you square that with uh, people who <laughs> who exhibit these behaviors yet? buy and engage in a lot of magic maybe in discussion we forums. don't we don't have enough um, <laughs> show time for me to discuss that very specific personality okay type. okay okay uh uh yeah no they're the worst people on the <laughs> let me read they, they let roam me read. an irradiated landscape with their with a, a pustule marked face with their uh, eyeballs falling out uh just menacing the countryside the let worst let me read you three paragraphs three paragraphs okay so it starts off, so who hates magic? Those who held more negative attitudes towards magic scored lower in openness to experience. They're also less prone to get absorbed or feel immersed, experience awe, or lose track of time. Further, individuals who are dogmatic or intolerant of uncertainty are more likely to dislike magic. Okay, interesting. Makes sense. La okay, and two more paragraphs. Lastly, numerous disagreeable traits were associated with disliking magic. People lower in agreeableness, uncooperative, socially cold, higher in psychopathy impulsive unempathetic and interpersonal dominance more likely to hate magic but here's the counterpart you ready for this yeah interestingly people higher in sadism had fire had more favorable <laughs> attitudes towards magic the authors speculate oh it's possible the interpersonal manipulation component of magic deceiving others and then withholding from them something they are dying to know has a certain sadistic appeal it is also possible that sadists enjoy the moments in a magic show where an audience volunteer is surprised or confused 
Or perhaps when they say they like magic, they're referring to the subset of magic, the genre of torture illusions that include Saw and a Woman Half, Jesus The Head Chopper, Zigzag Lady, The Assistance Revenge, and various escape from dangerous situations. Torture illusions. <laughs> so you like magic. What I, kind of magic do you like? I know. Uh, uh, in this article, do they give the exact phrasing of the question, do you like magic or, or, or magic illusions or... or... Do you like participating in them or seeing them or going to I magic shows? Them. I think probably in the study. They and, while, yeah, particulars. And, and while we're finding out that, has anyone ever used the phrase torture illusions to describe those? I mean, first of all, the majority of all illusions are torture illusions. Well, certainly so. I mean, like any kind of body manipulation or separating. But I, I don't think of those as are, coded as being, watch me torture this person. I mean, maybe a few people uh, that are sp specifically going out of their way. Let me take you on a journey back to 2006. Uh, YouTube was all of one year old, and our mutual friend CJ Johnson puts his uh, set of uh, illusions that he did at the Magic Island, and yet one of them was seven, eight, ten times more popular than the others. For some reason, it was the one in which the girl was flattened into a two-dimensional object. Uh, turns out there is a sexual fetish community that that's their thing. Is flattening women? Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think, went, I think he, got, he got like linked on a want. forum or something. Uh, he eventually figured out that that uh, like. It was all kind of in, in coded speak, but basically it's like, uh, <clears throat> hello, fellow appreciators of illusions. Here's one I think we'll all enjoy, wink face. And then it was... Gotcha, uh, yeah. And he found there's, that. There's studies that says some of these weird, uh, for lack of a better term, and not to shame, kinks, yes. can be related to like uh, how some brains are shaped differently and how some regions over-trigger, like, like how... There's a cluster for some people, their brain just, it's literally like a wiring thing. Cause they look at like people like foot fetishes and stuff like this and how they get triggered more by this than uh, other people. And like, and you wonder like the, cause like that flat thing is like, I heard that for like such a weird thing, not judging much unusual, but it is, it is an outlier towards experience that I'm familiar with and come from, you know, talk to people about. And you just wonder like, yeah, is that just, just trigger some group of neurons in a way like, Oh, you know, like. I mean, we think about it like, you know, I see, you know, boobs. I'm like, oh, yay, cool. And then from the, the, the cold calculus of the too. universe, why? <laughs> you too? Yeah. Like, why? Like, the universe is like, it's just it's just a couple algorithms. Why? But what's, it's another algorithm. So. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I think it was uh, David Sedaris was writing about how he was making money for a while writing uh, erotica do, uh, uh, themed around giantism. Like uh, like uh, fifty foot tall women and so yeah. on. That's a thing. Magic, oh. huh? Uh, so so. <laughs> okay, yeah. So so so, why do you think people? Do you, do we, yeah, I, I want to draw a circle around the sadism thing. Do you, do you see that a, a a higher level from inside the magic community of people that you would describe as sadists that they are very excited to hold the secret over somebody's head? Uh. Let's put a pin in that and let me bring up a totally unrelated topic. I have noticed that some people that I'm friendly with seem to agree that a lot of people should learn how to do magic. And some people who I disagree with yeah. seem to really want to hold back the secrets of magic. That's the end of my segment. Yeah, I mean, I guess... It's it's interesting to kind of parse through what the motivations are on that because like very rarely do I see the arguments the the arguments tend to be financial like against it like yes. that it's like you and, are ruining an industry and they're they're pretty poor arguments sure well yeah, yeah. Re regardless of the fidelity of the arguments if we're only trying to look at the motivations behind them. It, it's usually like, oh, well, I can't work. Somebody can't work. We're, we're enjoy or we are ruining this ability to make money almost as a, a, a before we get to the idea of before we can delight people. But even then, I, I, I think that there's there's not necessarily like a ooh, he, he I hold I will hold the, uh, the, the, the the secrets. In fact, when I was doing eye tricks with Andrew, the fastest way for me to find out the the method behind any magic trick is to hang out with a bunch of magicians 
And while they describe a very cool magic trick, I respond with, that's amazing. So in and other then, words, <laughs> by refusing to ask, by refuse to, I, people I, couldn't resist. No, but because magicians, tell especially you. because they work so hard on especially really, really good stuff, really, really clever stuff. It's like eventually they're just going to be like, yeah, no, it's a fake book. And, and I'm like, and so, uh, I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. That's, that's, that, that is, that's interesting and fun. I, I, I think it's, it's more from the inside of, of magic that you have a lot of like puzzle people. You have a lot of like people who really enjoy thinking through complex things and have applied that to the world of magic where it's like, oh, I can complicate you know, this pad of paper or, or a pen or something like that in a way that I can create something that the audience doesn't even know is a puzzle. Yeah, and uh, I, I tend to be kind of a, a big, big tent kind of guy when it comes to that. Like, I think there's places for academic magicians, people who read all the methods and could probably deconstruct and explain how just about any act you've ever seen is done for practicing magicians, people who are out there, you know, doing uh, full-time professional, part-time professional, uh, and, uh, and, and, and people who uh, quite literally just want to scratch the itch and don't mind doing the work to get there. And like... People, people have gotten and aren't sadists. <laughs> and like people are smarter nowadays. Like to uh, to people, I, and this is just going into the weeds of this, so we don't have to. But like people will be more impressed when they know how something's done. They will it, they will just enjoy no. more. No, and uh, not no. not always. Look, look, I'm not no. look, uh, in the thing that we do, the square block called game nation. Like like uh, showing how it's done gives people an appreciation for some of the basic elements of this. Uh, yes, there's surprise and there's all, but well, but you, it you is not it, 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 it's not flat out that learning how it's done ruins everything. You cultivate a certain audience to that too. I mean, there's a certain kind of audience that mm -hmm. says I want and that, that comes into appreciating. They appreciating yeah. secrets. They want to see. Oh, it was a paperclip the whole time. Oh, I love that. There's the other people like it was a GD paperclip. This is the dumbest thing in the world because some people come in there wanting. Oh no, it's really this Buddhist secret that we've kept like for a thousand yeah. years. Nobody knew about it. Levitation's real. Magic is a thing. Harry, Harry Potter, actual person, know him. There's some people who just come to it wanting that, but like, yeah, there's some people who go like, oh yeah, I, the more simple they appreciate it. They go, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. But other people do get, I do think it might lend to that. Some people get very angry when they find, oh, it's just this. Like, yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. You know, you blew know. on it? It's yeah. What a lie. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Like at some point, a key card is going to not be interesting to anybody. So whoa, whoa, maybe whoa, we can teach whoa, it to somebody whoa. and they could find out, it. hey, a key card's kind of cool. I used well, one to get into my hotel room. Yeah. <laughs> I think we saw you know, Penn and Teller have kind of made a big part of their repertoire. The whole, we'll show you how it's done and then we'll do it anyways. And you're still going to be entertained. Yeah. And uh, certainly some kinds of magic are better if you don't. I think they're, they're more entertaining if you don't know. And, we, and there's the argument like, wait, you should be a better performer. I'm like, well, you know, we all rise to our, our levels. <laughs> and, you know, in my case, I needed really clever magic tricks. <laughs> I needed really deceptive stuff. Uh, but anyhow, uh, changing topics here, gentlemen, mm -hmm. next up on the train. Uh so there was a random study about randomness, and the study had said, hey, we don't think people are really good at randomness, and we think that there's, you know, we've done a study, we think that people suck at this, and somebody else said, uh, you know what? I don't think your study's very good. We think that your study about randomness uh, was flawed. So if you go to, all right, rigorous scientific website here, uh, URL rather, um, everybody type this in. Uh, it Well, it's part of pudding.cool, so they did a whole thing about randomness. <laughs> okay. So if you go to uh, the pudding, they have this first link there. If you go pudding.cool, we found this cool study about randomness, and they actually are doing their own online test of randomness to figure out, could they replicate a study that said that people were really bad at that? And they looked through the data of the scatter plot of data, and they saw people were asked, like, oh, generate what you might think is a random number. And they saw a lot of people just type it in 0000, zero, 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 zero or 1111111. One, one, gotcha. one, 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 one. And they're like, that doesn't feel like somebody's taking the study that seriously. And then when they took that data and they separated those out, they're like, yeah, these people seem to be pretty random. You know, they're, they appears to be more random. So 
here what they're asking people to do is to try to predict like you think the outcome of 12 coin flips would be. So if you go back to the page and you click the results, you can see what their results were. Mm. And uh, let's... so they've been trying to recreate studies. So they go through and uh, they point out like the inability to replicate stuff. So they talk about the coin, coin toss complexity scores, et cetera. And they have a kind of a very well, you know, very polished website. And then if you scroll all down, down there, um, when they do it, with their, they compare the, the the study, and then their own study about ability to predict, you know, determine randomness. They found out their study showed, yeah, no, people are way better at being random than this implies. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating because I think if you control it the right way, then you are going to see, uh, uh, you know, the fact that people are, are 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 random mostly because you're taking away crutches in in the way that you describe that zero 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 thing where it's like. Somebody just kind of wants to see the results or or kind of just wants to get to the end of something. And so they're going to rely on the crutch of let me just hit one number a, a, a few times as opposed to generating what they believe is a random number. Uh, and not to get back to magic, but like that's a thing that is known amongst magicians, right? That like when you give people a deck of cards, they are overwhelmingly going to select one of a few cards for whatever reason. You know, right. th that is that is just a thing that happens so it's not really random. We are attracted to certain numbers. We're attracted to certain colors. We're attracted to certain uh, uh, things over over the other ones. So I think you really credit to these guys. They did the work and said, uh, hey, uh, exactly how do we want to make sure that this is about as uh, we are removing as many crutches as possible? So so if, if I'm understanding the article itself, it, it's much as um, over time we had the organic experience of figuring out like outside of the ace of spades, queen of, uh, uh, sure, queen of clubs, queen of hearts, and so on, uh, what are of the not top 10 most interesting cards what is the psychological map? If you were to think of a quote unquote random card, yeah. we get a picture of that uh, from the Scamnation stuff. They're doing the same thing for coin flips and for dice rolls for, for what it is an accurate map of what we assume a picture of randomness looks like. Yeah. And I think what's interesting too, is if you tell somebody a way to, a way to like, if you want to do the card thing and you want to negate and the magician picking a card, say, okay, I'm going to ask you to pick a card. I'm going to do this three times. I'm going to ask you to pick a card. I'm going to tell you to change your mind again. And then again, because I don't want you to pick the first thing everybody picks, so I'm going to make you work for it. And people get that because then by the time they get to the third card, they're picking things like four clubs or seven of diamonds, and they're not picking queen of hearts or ace of spades. And that's like one of the ways in the constructs of routine, you can say, okay, let's, let's, here's how we're going to get random. We're going to, I'm going to ask you three times to do this because I think your third one's really going to be random and I'm not going to keep going until you get the one I want. It will be the third. Here they kind of showing that's like a way of throwing out the 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 outliers here, and it's it's interesting because when they look at that data, it says like yeah, these the people performed much better on this test than they did. There was also like an age, and that was showing that that basically older people tended to like be less random and maybe just be impatient, like whatever zero 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 zero. Whatever. I don't care. Though I will say when I I just did it, I just did the the, the test here off screen. Uh, it asked if I was over 60 years old, and <laughs> that was their guess for my age. So uh, that would be yeah. incorrect, I would say. Well, they, they they found that they weren't that good at guessing ages based upon how random you were. Ah, well, mm. I, I would agree so, with that. But they were able to show that there there was a pretty, like, they Although showed us almost you great. you look great, Bryce. I'm looking great right you're over 60. Yeah, yeah, you look amazing. <laughs> the if, audio if you look at <laughs> you look at their data, you see a little bit of an elbow around 30, but other than that, it's pretty consistent across the board as far as like. Uh, so you know. to me, one of the most fun aspects of these kind of uh, experiments is asking the counterfactual, well, what were you hoping, Brian, to see? And what does that say about you? Um, like, like uh, I, I, I guess we have a tendency to hope that were logical Vulcans that would have a perfect uh, standard deviation bell curve kind of distribution. But if that's the case, why? Like, why, why would I want that? Why would that be better in any way? And of course, uh, the answer is it, it wouldn't. It's just, just our biases. 
Well, the, your uniqueness. I mean, I think that the idea that, like, any discussion of, let's say, free will is immediately problematic because trying to describe, we have to first describe what do we mean by free will. And, right. and that's the, you know, you can, any, any, any side can win an argument on free will by deciding in advance how they're going to define it. Yeah. And when we talk about, like, why do I want to feel... I want to feel I'm more complex. I want to feel that I'm a more complex system than than something that's extremely easy per, to predict. But I'm aware of the fact that I am probably very easy to predict. But I do think in the long range, you know, like my argument about free will is like, don't ask me the first thing that comes to my mind. Let me think about it. and I'll tell you the 12th thing and you're not going to be able to predict that. And it's about kind of, you know, and that's long form agency, which is harder to test in people who kind of argument like, oh, there's no such thing as free will because we saw the brain predict this thing before it happened. Like, yeah, that would make sense that our brain has to adapt to an environment where things that come out of nowhere, we don't stop and reason things out. We ad hoc reason it, but that trains us for later. And that's how we make our decision later. We go, ah, I should not have you know, shielded the spear with this side of my chest because I'm bleeding out on the ground and should I survive? You know, And that's, that's the thing I think gets lost is the, what we learn in AI and reinforcement learning is you... It's making a bunch of predictions and trying things out, but also like you just sort of go, go with this, go with this, go with this, which may say like, oh, see, we don't have free will, but it's like, yeah, I learned from it. It's like prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma with memory and history changes the outcome. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I suppose what I was leaning towards is uh, removing the value judgment where it's like, uh, it feels like a free choice when I walk into a grocery store and yet I always tend to go right where the vegetables are. Uh, uh, you know, and whether or not there, you know, there's that debate about whether or not the milk is in the back of the grocery store because that preserves the cold chain or whether it's because milk is valuable enough that they want to get you, they, whoever walk, they is, to, walk, to go yeah. all the way deep into the store or whatever. Um, I, 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 I suppose it's, it's, uh, uh, I, I rather enjoy thinking of those things without any kind of like right or wrong answers to them. That's just the way they are. Hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of that kind of uh, uh, psychology comes into marketing, right? Like just the idea of like, what is exciting? What is going to provoke a response immediately? In fact, a, a lot of it, especially as, uh, you know, content and media has uh, only exploded because it became cheaper to produce. Those are really the skills that, that are, are paramount of like in a world of clutter, uh, how can you get somebody to pay attention, click on a thing, uh, a, a follow for more, like all of these, uh, all of these kind of uh, idiomatic responses that that you can try and trigger. Mm -hmm. And and to clarify for our, our listeners that the so the studies that would sort of Im imply that free will as we believe it doesn't necessarily exist, not aren't about how often you make the same decision. It's monitoring the parts of your brain and seeing where a decision is made. And then the part of your brain that rationalizes it and watching how people come up with a rationalization after it was like, why did you do this? I did this because of this. And you're finding out like, no, something else made that choice. And the part that created this narrative came in later, which, and I would argue from an evolutionary point of view, of course, the thing that takes narrative takes more energy, takes more time. And that would be a very bad decision-making apparatus for most decisions. Yeah. Agreed. But again. I, will. I I cognitively choose to agree. <laughs> what do we have for picks, gentlemen? Hmm. Uh, I finally had time to watch a television show last night, and I watched Severance with my wife. Ooh. I like Severance. How far? I think it's in? a good show. I think we got that was episode four. I okay. watched last night. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, very uh, uh, uh you know, uh, uh. uh Twin Peaksy, you know, like a, a, uh, uh, just a fun, a fun show. I would, I would throw out the caveat and not, not that you're in dispute with this, but it has its logic and makes sense where Twin Peaks makes yeah. sense to David Lynch. <laughs> yeah, true, 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 true. I, and that's the thing is I'm, I'm not at the point where we're, we're still stacking questions on questions on questions. Uh, and so my wife was like theorizing about like, oh, well, is blank is blank? And, and what about blank? And uh, uh, I was like, well, I, I have a suspicion that at this point in this kind of story, we're, we're probably going to get supposed to know. <laughs> well, also that we're going to get 
four more questions on top of all the questions that we already know before we start getting uh, uh, any answers. But uh, so far, I mean, just what a what a, a great collection of talent uh, uh, and and a story told in a small uh, a, a small window with gigantic implications. Uh, I, peripherally related. I'm, I'm going to make my pick something I have yet to experience, but I'm very excited about it. Uh, the Stanley Parable has a deluxe edition that just came out. So if you like the bizarreness of, of Severance uh, about the kind of closed box uh, mystery that it presents, uh, the ultra deluxe version of Stanley Parable uh, already, all I've seen is about <laughs> five minutes where the first thing it does is ask you to set the time and then it mocks you for putting in the accurate time. Like, really? You think I don't know what time it is? That's hilarious. <laughs> and then, I, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm really excited. I just want to touch something to back in Severance. What I appreciated from the first episode, and I'm going to spoil alert this time, you should watch the first episode, is when Hallie goes running out the door and she comes running back in. It felt like a portal. It felt like yeah. this. You're like, how is this happening? Like, and then I'm like, okay, it's it's magic. It's a weird realm. I'll just go with it. And then a little while later, ten minutes later, we get an explanation. Oh yeah, your brain just switched off, right. and you have no memory. And I'm like, oh, I love this because it was like a lost level sort of mystery that could have been never resolved for us. Yeah. But they said no. This is the rules of how this works, and you go, oh man, that's effed up. And it, so I it, was just it has a very very moment. strong internal logic that remains consistent. And, yeah. And yeah. that's that's it's easy for uh, a lesser show to blow that over, but they don't in Severance. They yeah, really pay it. Exactly. exactly. I really exactly. I, I really really loved and appreciated that that it is sci-fi at it's the dip, the line between sci-fi and fantasy, which has gotten blurred through the years, uh, is that sci-fi should have internal logic that you are, yeah. that you are, I mean, and, and strong fantasy should have it too. But once you enter into the world of espers and magic and everything, then you can always say that, no, there's a deeper magic that you've not learned. Uh, whereas sci-fi, yeah. it's like, you should, you should always have like, okay, that, that's why there's tension to anything. Yeah, and, they're, they're, and it's say that, you know, you can, as an author or a creator, say no, and that's fine, but at your own peril. And it, yeah. it doesn't mean you have to reveal it. You can, like Christopher Nolan in Inception has his own, well, this is what's going on, and he's decided, no, I'm not going to tell you, but he knows. And there's a consistency, and you can you can come up with an explanation that is entirely consistent with the facts and be, okay, I, I, I've settled for this because it fits everything. And I love that. I love that, where you don't have to tell us. But let me make it. Let me not think that it's just a writer's room trying to come up with the most bat, rap crazy things yeah. they could to try to keep us entertained and tune in next week for the promise of the reveal, right? And to find out nothing. And like, d despite all that, Severance gets away with doing a ton of cliffhangers because it has a good sense of how to pay off mm -hmm. the, the, those. The well, moments. because uh, underlying is a gigantic mystery, right? Right, and it's like, and and uh. uh there's a lot to unpack and and what I like about the show or at least the the premise of the show is that I'm there's so much that I want to know there are so many mysteries that you can then complicate based on where the characters move that it's like there's a lot of meat on this bone like there is there is more than one season's worth of meat here and I am I am I'm pumped about that nice uh oh uh, Brian, you, you you watched someone play some of Stanley Parable? Uh, yeah, Ultra Josie Deluxe? started playing Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. Um, uh, I I only got to see the very very opening and then the opening scene, which was identical to the original. But of course, I'm gonna assume that they have a deeper game that they're playing. Um, the uh, it is kind of funny. There's one fake out ending that is an inside joke of the you know dozens or hundreds of different endings in the original. There's one that is utterly disappointing but the narrator makes a joke about how oh i hope all of you just talk about how this is the best ending Ooh, i hope you get the broom closet ending <laughs> and it becomes this inside joke and then that becomes the top comment on the ultra deluxe version is ever like oh i hope the broom Broom's closet, closet ending yeah. is still there <laughs> <laughs> that's great very nice uh i've also got a video game pick uh this uh i ended up grabbing this uh uh, just before we went out to Las Vegas over the weekend. 
and have really enjoyed it. Uh, kind of expensive for for kind of, kind of expensive for a mobile game, but I'm really enjoying it. It is the new Zach Gage and Jack Schlesinger app, not words. Uh, you might know Zach Gage from uh, Spell Tower or Bad Sudoku. Um, uh, this is their new uh, puzzle game. It is like a uh, it's like a reverse crossword puzzle. So you're given uh, a layout of crossing words, um, and you're given the letters as hints, and they're in these kind of uh, uh, d- uh, different clusters of tiles. And so you have to arrange all of the letters in each cluster such that uh, every word, every uh, uh, every section of more than two of two or more consecutive tiles is a word. Uh, so there's a lot of two letter words and three letter words to just fill in everything. But um, it's really it's really interesting uh, in terms of being uh, it's this is a good day. It's a good time to get into puzzle games because this is like this is a pretty unique way of making a puzzle game like this. Um, uh, a little expensive, maybe you it's free. You can play the daily for free. You can play the month, uh, some of the monthly puzzles for free. Um, and either pay five dollars per year or twelve dollars for a lifetime. Uh, and there's a lot of puzzles in here. A little, little bit of a high price, but I but I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I was able to play it offline. I got a, there's easy stuff, harder stuff, um, and uh, for like a mobile game to just blip 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 just in a minute, uh, I really dug it. So that's uh, not words. It's on mobile and it's on PC. Twelve dollars per lifetime equals expensive? Question mark for a mobile game. Okay. All and right. for I, one that says like we're going to be five dollars per year, or you can pay us less than three years for perpetuity. Well, and I, I how I, how many mobile games do you play for more than three years? I I think. Uh, but maybe, I think it is worth twelve dollars. So. Maybe my head's in the wrong space because like um, uh, uh, Callie is now at the right age where for the third time I paid ten dollars for Dragon Box to teach uh, uh, algebra to to the kids mm-hmm. and and. Uh, it's it's so funny when 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 it's a learning moment that you're doing. All of a sudden, you don't you know ten bucks whatever. Learn learn algebra, kid. Yeah, Dragon Box is the bomb. It's great. It's great. And and what's funny is like she's now like she's at the point where it's all plus and minus and letters and numbers and all that. She's now well past uh, the 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 symbolic part and into the part where it's nothing but actual. Uh, uh, numbers and letters and she's like i still don't understand how i'm doing algebra <laughs> and i'm like that's fine you understand enough you algebra. are way too young to really need to know how I, you're doing the algebra just yet if you haven't tried dragon box or curious about math just do it because it's i remember i'm like all right this game that's kind of fun but like i don't like well how am i learning this and then it does this sort of vroom reveal yes. and you're like oh all it no. does is change the symbols and you're like oh my god yeah wonderful uh my pick is yellowstone season four specifically season four well i just finished season four i love yellowstone so i just finished the latest season so uh if you haven't watched yellowstone i highly recommend yellowstone uh yellowstone is the most successful television franchise there is right now yeah and um uh they're doing they have 1883 which we just started which is another spinoff. Then they're going to be doing another spinoff, which is the the triple, the quadruple four six ranch, which will be interesting because there's a whole story behind that. Um, one of the characters on the show is actually the co- is the co creator Taylor Sheridan, who's an actor and interesting guy himself. And uh, they did this thing in season four where one of these characters, you know, like Kevin Costner, says, "Yeah, we want to be like the 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 four six ranch in Texas because that's." That's where we want to be, and it's like that's eh, kind of interesting, sort of phrasing, like the, to to talk about this ranch. And it turns out it's a real ranch that Taylor shared, and some people bought. Ah. And it's one of the largest, and it's actually going to be a spinoff. So I'm like, oh, cool. It's really that's that's, that's a great, you know, kind of a spinoff. For and you, so. and does he? I mean, I know for Yellowstone, he writes every episode by himself. Uh, uh, I I think he might do the spinoffs too. Like like he is a, I think, yeah, a machine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, this is kind of the new, the new sort of model, uh, is, is the having, you know, just like the one creator sort of just totally write everything. Although I think, and I think, I think it works for him for the most part. I think that, uh, 
there are other showrunners and director writers who do this and i go like man you should really have a writer's room yeah like some of the star wars stuff like a writer's room would have made the stuff a good writers would make it better yeah um but here i think he does a really good job and man does he love horses does he love horses <laughs> that man loves horses yeah yeah so gentlemen i love magic me too me too. And it's been weird. Hey! Ooh. <laughs> Alrighty. There we go. Uh, we'll take a second and do some after things. Uh, yeah, now's a good time to take a break if you need to. Yeah, I couldn't hold out. I had to go during the... Uh, during the, uh, the, the... During the show. During the recommendations. The picks. The picks. The picks. The, the picks. The picks. You got a hard out? Main. I got a heart out in 35, 40 minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I emailed you something that might. Yep. That was for after things. Do you want to do that? Yep. 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 We'll okay. do that. Okay. Uh, that email is long, but I can digest. I can shrink it quite a bit uh, if you'd like. Uh, already, everybody, we're going to do some after things here in just a few moments. Hello. Um, hello. Hello. What did I see? I saw something in the news. I've been keep. I've keep. I'm keeping a tab on my Safari or a tab group in my Safari for interesting news stories. And uh, oh yes, this was the one I saw today. Uh, so a few years ago, a man's um, back in 2010, his uh, his Johnson uh, fell off. Okay. Uh, he had a blood disorder or a blood disease, and it just fell off. So uh, he's an he's an Englishman, uh, and doctors created a new Johnson on his left arm. From his left arm? Uh, from and on. So he now just has his member on his left arm. Uh, he did for about t t eleven or twelve years. Don't tell me it fell off. They have finally put it in the correct position. Was he on a waiting list? I think uh, uh, he he was just, I think they were waiting for it to grow. Part of it was it was like regrow, being regrown and grafted. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, why did it take so long? There For, for whatever reason, it did, there, there was, um, oh, here we go. Uh, the scheduling mix-ups, sh staff shortages, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, all affected this, um, and and he's got that's part of it. There's a documentary about him now. Oh, so. gotcha. Um, but uh, uh, but he talks about living his life in public, having a Johnson on his arm. Yeah, including a story of grabbing an item from the grocery store for an old lady and having his finger flip out. Wow, jeez, Louise. Yeah, Jiminy, Jiminy, Bimini, Jiminy, Bimini. But uh. Uh, there's apparently a man in England uh, uh, what had a uh, uh, had to grow a, a member on his arm because his fell off. It fell off. It it's not yeah, like it, it does. It's not like a le it wasn't like a leprosy in like oh it deteriorated like it fell off. I I I've got a million questions, none of which are appropriate for this hour of the day. So uh, I I feel like we should leave this as a J.J. Abrams style mystery box and move along. I'll just direct you over to the New York just Post. Go and yeah, go and read up on that because I got a, I got I got, yeah. Anyway, no, we're not. We're gonna move on. We're gonna move on. All right. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, Justin, did you need a break? No. No. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, all righty. Brian is back. Andrew's back. All right. Uh, Andrew, you ready to do some after things? Yeah, why the hell not? Oh, why not indeed? Okay, well, uh, I shall count you in then for after things. Uh, here we go. In three, two... Hello and welcome to After Things. I am Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. And Brian Brushwood. Howdy, howdy, howdy. 
So our favorite thing at after things is when somebody acknowledges that we exist and sends us an email. That's true. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We're real. Good We're to, real. Good, good to know. Good to know. Bryce, I understand we have an email. Uh, that's right. We got an email from. We got an email. We got one. <laughs> Do we need to even read it? I mean, isn't it enough that we got one? We got it. We got Why it. Why look a gift horse in its mouth? Uh, yes. Here we go. We got this from a Nate. There we go. I just want to make sure I scrubbed his email. Um, uh, and sent a very nice, a very nice email about uh about Dolly. We talked about this on Weird Things. The new, the new Dolly Open AI, Open AI uh, machine learning model where you. Give it plain text of an image you want it to make, and it makes an image mm -hmm. from from what you uh, what you describe. Uh, good morning. I also sent a version of this to Andrew, but with the power of AI to enhance and expand the power of creativity, I thought the gender question in this email um, might be applicable to After Things. My mind was buzzing after listening to the Weird Things episode all about Dolly too. Uh, I've been a longtime supporter. Um, uh, I've been into magic for most of my life, and that's how I found Justin, Brian, Andrew, and you through that route over the past decade. I have been. Uh, had less and less time for magic because I've shifted uh, to my business uh, and my passion of uh, 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 of selling tools and gauges for auto parts to my passion of early childhood education uh, and special education. Uh, my youngest child is starting kindergarten in a few years, and I want to shift focus to how I can empower my students, uh, the, my students, colleagues, teachers, and schools that we work with. Um, and uh, to take a more active day-to-day -day role in the university. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Nate's, Nate's question is, uh, I'm excited about the prospect, but also overwhelmed at how to learn machine learning and AI. Would you please provide me with some guidance on where to start? Point me in the right direction with parenting and work at UD. I want to maximize the use of my time. Based on what I've learned through After Things, I've purchased a couple of Python, JavaScript, machine learning, and neural network courses on Udemy and bought a book that I found very engaging called Becoming a Data Head. I don't have a deep reservoir of knowledge in math and computing, but I love to and know how to learn. I hope you have a fun Wednesday. Nate. Thank you, Nate. I would say that there's kind of a couple things that machine learning and understanding AI would involve. Uh, one, there are the concepts of it. A lot of the concepts are actually pretty easy to sort of grasp. Like, you know, deep learning is the idea of you give something a bunch of data and you come up with a, a way for a system to start asking questions. Does this match this? Does this match that? And to try to find patterns that it can then use to create a model to make predictions. And there's programming side of it, like learning, you know, how to implement this using you know, Python, which is probably the most popular language right now for machine learning. And then there's the data science part of it, which is if I want to build, you know, a, a good model for, let's say, predicting images, how many images do I need? How do I separate those images? How do I find them? How do I do this? So there's kind of like three areas to that. I would say a very easy way and a free way to get into it to sort of understand some of the basic premises. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, there's a... TensorFlow is a library for like learning it, but TensorFlow, like trying to even get into that would probably be, would have been over my head when I first started, but they have a thing called TensorFlow.js. So if you go to tensorflow.org slash JS, and this is something put out by Google, they have a lot of real easy intro, like examples where they kind of show you, this is ML, you're going to train a model to do this. And they all work in the browser. And, and the advantage of it working in the browser is you don't have to learn yet about more advanced Python programming. You don't have to learn about, you know, some of the other skills that you're going to want to need, but it's a very good stepping stone to get started. And so you could start playing around with things and playing around with some of these examples and take them apart. So I would say that's a good place. Uh, I think code.org, let me check with code.org. And don't, don't be afraid of doing stuff that's meant for kids. I mean, that's the honest thing is yeah. that some of these, some people just assume that everybody's starting off in coming out of some graduate or coming out of some college degree program. And a lot of us just start late in life and don't be afraid of the things that are just the kids. So code.org has good resources and they're simple little games and stuff, but they want to treat, teach some concepts. So that's a place tutorials. Another advice about a tutorial is start the, any one of those tutorials that you took, start it. And then once you get to a point where like, this is really over my head, this may be the worst advice in the world, but I sometimes like, well, I'll go do a different tutorial and I'll just try that one and take it as far as I can. And I find that I start seesawing and 
improving my understanding. Uh, can I ask a, a broad question? If you were looking to get into something like machine learning, is it better to try and find a project or an application that you would like to do with machine learning, or is it better to to kind of uh, get some of the basics under uh, under your belt first and understand in general what it is? So the the advantage of having some basics is you have an idea what the realm of the possible is. Gotcha. And but the advantage of having a project is, is you have a motivation. And I would say I would watch some YouTube videos and just get a basic understanding of like machine learning and just to see like what can these things do. Another good course, which is free, is I think it's fast, a fast AI. And some of these like fast AI, uh, let me see if I can find it, is that's designed to go from zero to uh, being able to do stuff. And it starts off like you don't have to be a math person, you know, everybody are, you know, they're, they get into like, they really want to be as user friendly. So I would say if you want to start somewhere, start with go to fast.ai and take a look there and read through some of the articles. And they started kind of explaining a broad sort of uh, did there. I, I remember doing their course a couple of years ago and it gave a pretty good overview of AI and they just sort of want to get people up to speed and to be able to start doing stuff. So I would say that just having to understand how it's possible, because if you start off with wanting to do something really complex and you, you may get discouraged. Yeah. But mm -hmm. either way, like just you start to see like fast AI was actually that course. They talked about they have a very introductory level course, which explains how to build a system for doing image recognition to say this image is this, this image is that, you know, the classic ones, dogs and cats. And one of the students there said, I wonder if I took the output of a file that was a virus, could I build an image detection system that would just spot an image by looking for photos of basically code? And he actually built a company and a business doing an introductory level AI course, was able to create a workable proof that was a ended up being a company based upon, oh, what if I use this image detection system for viruses in computers? And, and people are like, Oh yeah, I guess you could because there might be like a lot of jaggies or something like that. And that's what I loved was that there are so many low, there's so much low hanging fruit out there, so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and I, I, Nate, I don't know how much into coding you are. I know he, they they mentioned buying the Python and JavaScript and some other courses. Um, but if you're not even into coding, if you're like very very beginner at this. Um, Swift Playgrounds is very good for getting you into figuring out what it's like building and running code. Um, and then uh, 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 Human Resource Machine is a fantastic game to learn coding philosophies and concepts uh, without getting bogged into a specific language. But I think those are also really good places to start um, if you don't even know Java, Python, whatever. Yeah, there's... There's uh, just look for courses, beginners, and you'll, you'll start to get on board. It, it takes time. It takes persistence. Don't be afraid to walk away after 40 minutes. Like I, I'm learning a new environment right now, and I realize like 30 minutes of this and my brain is full, and I got to walk away and do something else. I can't just sit there for six hours and just squeeze it into my head. It just doesn't work. And, and it, people look at it and go like, that's the simplest thing in the world. How come? I'm like, just, just my brain. Uh, Ju Justin, to your question earlier of like, should you start with a project or should you start with with learning, you know, elements and, and foundations? And it's like it's a it's a mix, right? Like, I know that the courses that I've done on Udemy have been very helpful because they're structured around real real projects, mm -hmm. um, and then you get into a space of what's something little I can make, what's something, what are the tools that I have with me, and what can I make out of them. You know, Andrew, like you've talked a lot about making a lot of little demos with machine learning, with with open AI stuff. Um, those aren't uh, those seem more like, uh, for lack of a better word, sketches of ideas than say full. Let's really make it a capital P project. Would, would you say that that's uh, accurate? Uh, like the demos. I mean, I, I'll do. I'll do proof of concept deployments internally that to show companies this is what you would this is how you solve the problem mm. so 
I mean, I well, you've made like chat bots and public facing. Yeah, but, little... but and like yeah, and some of the stuff I do is like I'll take an API, like the OpenAI API, and say, okay, this is how you actually, this is how you do the thing. Like, let me solve a problem to show people because like, well, how would you do this? Like, well, if you do this, you do that. So, uh, yeah, you know, that's, you know. I think to anything, just try projects. Just make, yeah, but to your point, like, yeah, just make things. Just make a bunch of things. Make a lot of little stuff. Yeah. Oh, man, I made a thing that turns, that flips an image. Ugh. I think I think in general, like, that is that is the greatest lesson that we always kind of repackage over and over and over again on this uh, uh, segment is, like, boy, does getting to the end of a project teach you everything you need to know about the project Absolutely. right like just uh, if, if you can if you can do that you are you are doing uh you're doing good work yeah um you know uh even even if you are not building something entirely uh functional like just see what you can make with the the, the with as far with the tools that you've learned so far in at any of your given courses if they don't already have something like that i mean to to me my favorite part of the javascript course thing i was doing was here's a problem uh you figure it out and when you either think you've got it or when you get stuck then you watch the video of me writing out the code and then yeah and then hey the next day try it again and then don't look at the video or like do like you kind of have to be your own taskmaster a little bit of like yeah you're gonna learn stuff by doing it over and over again um and even doing the exact same thing helps when it's something that uh, uh, that you only have light familiarity with. Absolutely. Um. Uh. Cool. Um. Sorry about that. Uh. Very cool. Uh. Anybody want to do some after things picks? Maybe. Uh. Just to uh, check in. Up? We talked about it last week, but oh, yeah. uh, Barry Jones's graphic novel, The Book of Nile, about uh, uh, dissociative uh, uh, depersonalization disorder. Uh, it uh, it it is uh, uh, quadruple funded, about to be quintuple funded. Wow. Uh, Sixty hours left to go. Get your hands on this. It's a it's a magical magic book. And and also, if you already backed, he has uh, opened up a few of the top. Uh, uh, of uh, a few more of the top uh, uh, rewards. In fact, th those might actually be gone. Uh, uh, I have not checked since he sent uh, since he sent the update. Uh, he, he also, I believe, is is actually literally having to invent new rewards right now <laughs> for, for for folks. But uh, uh, I could be happier for him. He's crushing it. Yeah. Uh, 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 just let me let me just also reiterate the magic about that. Uh, book is that he taught himself to draw to do it wait really oh, he I was not an uh, like a childhood illustrator no. he, he he learned as an adult to draw okay. and i think his uh uh style is which is like unconventional but looks amazing uh is is kind of reflective of that is that he was he, he wasn't somebody that grew up redrawing his favorite comics or anything like he wanted to come up with a a style for himself to tell this story specifically and it's it's really remarkable uh uh he's a tremendously talented dude and uh uh this story uh, Brian has read it and, and and found it remarkable so uh I don't know uh, go 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 check it out if you have not if you're listening to this if you're listening to after things you'll love it you are yep. pre-qualified to love it so yeah. so uh a uh, book of Nile N I A L L, go check that out. Yeah, I backed it. Oh, there we go. So did I. Yeah, I'm gonna Last see time. if there's any. Uh, see if there's any any new rewards. Any rewards that might up my pledge. Yeah, pledge. Uh, I just want to and follow through on the. Everybody learns at their own pace. you know when i was younger and had a lot more time i could just you know whiz through some of these courses pretty fast now it takes me longer but I still do them and sometimes i just go i'll do a third of the course because i'm like oh, okay i get enough i know what i need to know now and you know don't don't feel like you can do it to say oh i want the certificate to prove to other people i do it because i just want that knowledge i just want to know how to solve a problem yeah uh, uh just any time just 
it it all it all works. You know, I I was I was using this metaphor um, <laughs> to somebody while I was uh, uh, not going to sleep and therefore missed my five o'clock flight from Vegas. But <laughs> uh, I would say learning is a lot like uh, sleeping. Uh, uh, it's kind of like charging your iPhone. Triple metaphor. Uh, it doesn't matter how much or how long you do it. You are always thankful if you are on on a 1% battery. If you plug it in for 30 seconds and now you have a 4% battery, it is better. You know, yep. like so any little bit uh uh to to move forward on a passion, move forward on a skill, like it all adds up. The the the, the most self-toxic thoughts that you can have are I'm not learning correctly. You know, right. uh, because that is the process. All you got to do is put your head down and keep going forward. The other one that's that is is that I'm too old. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. And if I so. if I should have been doing this, I would have been doing this earlier. And I'm not naturally inclined to do X, Y, and Z. Just, just jump on in. Yeah, yeah I didn't write books. Fine. I didn't start writing novels till I was 37. I didn't learn really learn to code till my 40s. Huh? And. And now you are a best-selling author that works at AI, the leading AI company. <laughs> Only I'd started sooner, but it's I wouldn't been able to. I I would have been that person. I would not been able to do that. So yeah, I just yeah. I think that you know sometimes some of us kind of out the gate have an idea of what we want to do, and some of us it take longer, and we have to try stuff. Mm -hmm. Either way, just keep trying. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yep. I I got a quick pick. Uh, things. Uh, this was my lifeline while we were in Vegas and it made sure that I got the things that I needed to do done and that I had all the right information at my fingertips. To, to be clear, you're talking about a product called things. It, yeah. Okay. Sorry. It, yeah. <laughs> it, I, I've talked about it on the show enough. I thought like maybe they just know, no, there's an no. app on the phone. A on productivity the app yeah. called okay. things. It's, got it. Uh, it's great. It, it is also a little expensive, especially on the iPad and the Mac, but it's very good, very intuitive things. Cool. Yeah. Any other after things? I, I know. Yeah. My 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 pick was Book of Nile. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Barry. Uh, what a what a good what a good man. Two Hot. two two thousand six hundred something dollars away from from hitting twenty k. Yeah. Wow. Make it happen. Uh, my other pick is when you're in Vegas, uh, keep referring to your uh, the blackjack dealer that was there before your current blackjack dealer as having kind eyes. <laughs> it makes for a very awkward moment that uh, was very funny to me. And then drop a poker chip into your hot cocoa. Yep, <laughs> yep. We're all on the same page. Love it. My friend, do you have a pick? Yes, it, it was, was no, yeah, 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 yeah. He did. Yeah, we, 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 we both did that. We both did that. Yeah. All right. Cool. Then my pick is Fireship uh, YouTube channel. Go to YouTube.com/slash Fireship, and if you want to start learning about code, uh, this is uh, a great channel. Jeff, the guy who does it, does these short videos and longer videos, and you just start doing a deep dive. Like, what is C? What is the C programming language? Well, he'll explain it to you. You know, what is this? He'll get into like how to get started on stuff. And when I first started watching this channel, a lot of this was way over my head. Some of it still is, but it's just a great way to sort of get into, he's got just great videos. He's a really great explainer and it gets you just sort of like background on a lot of things. So if you watch this, you start to go, oh, okay, I, I know what this library is, or I know what Pearl does, or, you know, he's, he's he did one lately, uh, java for haters which he just rips into java mm -hmm. not javascript but java which yeah. is kind of amazing and so some now and then he'll do these like for haters sort of thing and he just will rip into something but um really really good well-produced videos uh so that is my pick is fireship on youtube youtube.com awesome. slash fireship fireship fire fire. space yeah and gentlemen it's been after in space. Space. Alrighty. Hey, good show, everybody. Good stuff. Good times. Good times. Good jarbs. Good jorb. Uh, awesome. Well, uh, we got court killers coming up in about uh, three and a half hours or so. Uh, everybody. Good stuff. Yep. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Alrighty. Well, we're going to go offline. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. 
We'll see you later. Yep.